So hello to everyone. We are back again to the EasyCam eChat. And I have the pleasure today to welcome Lars Andersen from Oris, Denmark. Hi, Lars. Hey. Um, the reasons why I asked Lars to participate to the chat today is to discuss with him about the management of in-hospital cardiac arrest. Lars Andersen is one of the uh, people who has worked the, the most in that setting since the last years. And uh, Lars, can you tell us how the way that we manage in-hospital cardiac arrest, is it based on evidence? We have uh, good studies in that setting or we have uh, still a lot of uh, knowledge gaps? Thank you very much, Fabio, and thanks for having me. Um, well, I wouldn't say it's based on evidence, or at least it's not based on direct evidence. As you know, most of the things we do uh, within hospital cardiac arrest patients, both during the cardiac arrest, but also in the post cardiac arrest period, is really based on extrapolation from the out of hospital cardiac arrest setting. Even in the out of hospital cardiac arrest setting, we don't have that many studies, but at least within the last 10, 20 years, we've seen more and more large trials coming out. Unfortunately, that's not been the, the case for in-hospital cardiac arrest. So most of what we do in the in-hospital cardiac arrest setting is really trying to extrapolate things we found in the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest setting to the in-hospital cardiac arrest setting. Um, is it something that is uh, incorrect? I mean, are, th are there so many differences between out-of-hospital and in-hospital cardiac arrest, which would require specific studies for these patients? Yeah, I think that's, a, that's an excellent question. And I think uh, a few years ago, I thought that I knew the answer to that, that the two populations were extremely different. Um, but we actually very recently did a, a study here in Denmark, an observational study where we looked at all out of hospital cardiac arrest and all in hospital cardiac arrest. And we can do that because we have very good registries here in Denmark. And then we compared the two populations. And I was actually surprised that on some characteristics, they're quite similar. So the age distribution, uh, the <clears throat> number of men, the most of the comorbidities were actually also similar. It was based on ICD-10 codes, but still they were quite similar. So on, on, on some factors or some characteristics, the two patient populations are actually very similar and it might be reasonable to extrapolate some of the things. However, there's of course very important differences as well. And one of the most important is probably what we do to the patients once they have a cardiac arrest. So in the in-hospital setting, things move very quickly. There's usually someone right next to the patient who's trained in CPR and can start uh, basic life support right away. And within minutes, there's an advanced life support team, whereas in the out of hospital cardiac arrest setting, it might be up to seven or 10 minutes before they arrive. It also means that something like drug delivery is much faster in the in-hospital cardiac arrest setting. So I do think, especially for the intra-cardiac arrest management, there are some differences. In the post-cardiac arrest um, management, there's also some important differences. As you know, in the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest setting, most patients die of neurological injury or neurological withdrawal of care. In the in-hospital cardiac arrest setting, that's a little bit more complex. There are more patients dying from other reasons, such as hemodynamic collapse, respiratory issues, or withdrawal of care due to other things, such as severe comorbidities or cancer or other things like that. So, so I do think there are some similarities, but there are also important differences that we need to consider when doing trials and also when trying to extrapolate findings. Uh, you have just released uh, a trial that uh, targeted this patient population of in-hospital cardiac arrest, which is the VAMICA trial, if I say it correct, using the acronym. Can you tell us the background and why you designed this study? Yeah, so, so I became interested in in-hospital cardiac arrest uh, a few year, years ago um, because that was in, when I was in the United States, in Boston, uh, doing some of my research. They had a lot of good registers for in-hospital cardiac arrest. So I became interested in that area. And then we were looking at what, what, what trials are actually have been done in this setting. And it's very, very few. We did a, some systematic reviews and have looked at it. Uh, and, and two of the trials that really stood out were these two trials from Greece by Spiros Mitsilopoulos, published in 2009 and 2013, looking at this combination of vasopressin and methylprednisolone for in-hospital cardiac arrest. And these trials are quite remarkable. They were well done. They were double-blinded. They were randomized. And both of them found an incredible effect, an increase in return of spontaneous circulation, and more importantly, also a statistically significant increase in survival and favorable neurological outcome. So then some years later, I was looking at the guidelines and I saw that these treatments were not recommended. And perhaps that was fair. It was the two relatively small trials. So I thought, 
if 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 we have something that works in in-hospital cardiac arrest, we need to figure it out. This is such a shame if there's actually something that works, but it just hasn't been tested in larger trials. So back in 2017, I started to plan the trial and, and write the protocol. Um, and that's really the background for it. So we designed what Vemica trial, which is the vasopressin and methylprednisolone trial for in-hospital cardiac arrest. So Lars, the paper has uh, been published on JAMA, and of course I have to congratulate you and all the, the team that has uh, conducted this uh, very, very good trial for the very good results, of course, and high quality of the study you have presented. Can you summarize for our audience the main results of this study? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so it was uh, presented last night at Critical Care Reviews and then co-published uh, in JAMA. So we're very happy with that. Uh, the trial was conducted in uh, 10 sites, 10 hospitals in Denmark. We included uh, 501 patients and they were randomized to vasopressin and methylprednisolone during the cardiac arrest. We gave uh, 20 units uh, of vasopressin and 40 milligrams of methylprednisolone after the first dose of adrenaline, and then subsequent vasopressin doses after each dose of adrenaline. And in the other group, they received placebo for all of that. We um, then had the primary outcome being return of spontaneous circulation, and we found actually that the intervention, so the combination of vasopressin and methylprednisolone, increased return of spontaneous circulation. There were 42% who had return of spontaneous circulation in the intervention group compared to 33% in the placebo group. And this is, of course, both clinically relevant. It's a fairly large effect, almost 10% absolute risk difference, but it was also statistically significant. Unfortunately, we did not find a difference in some of the more patient-centered long-term outcomes, such as 30-day survival or 30-day favorable neurological outcome. Actually, there was no difference between the groups there. And the, the study was not powered for those outcomes, so the confidence intervals were quite wide for those outcomes, meaning that we cannot really exclude there being either benefit or harm with the intervention. And results were similar to 30-day outcomes. Okay. Now, of course, people will say now you have two trials that have shown an increased risk rate and the benefits in outcome, and one larger trial was show similar results on ROS, but different results on uh, patient center outcomes. What happens if you combine them? Yeah, so we are actually working on a meta-analysis of these trials. And we thought, given that there are not that many trials, it would be an ideal opportunity to look at what we call an individual participant uh, meta-analysis where we combine the data. And we are very thankful to Spurus uh, from the Greek team who shared the data with us. And we've been working on a meta-analysis. So the results are fairly uh, consistent with uh, our latest trial in terms of return of spontaneous circulation. All three trials uh, find a clear effect on return of spontaneous circulation. So I think with some confidence, we can say this intervention increases return of spontaneous circulation. Where it becomes a little bit more tricky is for the other outcomes. Of course, there was a very large effect in the previous trials and really no sign of an effect in our trials. So therefore, the there's a lot of heterogeneity between the trials, so it's important to sort of consider that when interpreting the meta-analysis results. However, for both survival and for favorable neurological outcome, the point estimate certainly favors the intervention, but there's, again, there's some wide confidence intervals, and for both of them, um, the confidence intervals do not exclude no effect, so it was not statistically significant. We also conducted a number of other uh, analysis, Bayesian analysis, for example, looking at how can we interpret the results based on different prior values? And again, for return of spontaneous circulation, the results were quite clear. There seems to be an effect, no matter what our prior beliefs are, reasonable prior beliefs. Whereas for survival and favorable neurological outcomes, the results are really more uncertain. And we can see that in the Bayesian analysis as well. Uh, can we tell us that maybe we are a little bit back with the discussion we had a few years ago with adrenaline. We have a drug which is able, of course, of restart the heart, but in some trials, at least the effect on neurological outcome are controversial or debatable. Are we back to this point again? We have a drug that have more patients being admitted alive to the ICU, but will not affect really the outcome. What people should do, because basically we are giving a drug that has the vasoconstrictor, so it's logical that this drug will restart the heart. On the other side, you can say I can shorten the low flow time. I would expect to have a better survival rate, but I cannot. But this drug is not a neuroprotected. So should we, just, uh, should we just keep it as vasoconstrictor and say we can use it if you want to increase ROSC rate? 
Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And it applies to many of the mm -hmm. drugs we give during cardiac arrest. It even applies to some of the antiarrhythmics, right? The trials show that there's an increase in ROS, but there's no definite uh, increase in survival or favorable neurological outcome. And maybe that's also too much to ask, as you say. Maybe that's not the goal. Maybe the goal during cardiac arrest is to get return of spontaneous circulation, and then we will let people in the ICU try to save people afterwards. I think it's it's a complex question, and I don't have a, a final answer. I do think for some uh, situation, ROSC might be a, a, a reasonable outcome. Uh, it also perhaps increases uh, organ donation, another important outcome, as we saw in the paramedic trial. That is not probably the case for in-hospital cardiac arrest as much, but still a consideration. Maybe it's a valuable outcome for some patients and families that they get some time to say goodbye to their to their loved ones. And then, of course, the last thing is maybe post-cardiac arrest care will uh, develop in the future. Maybe we'll get better at neuroprotection, and maybe some of these patients would be able to have a good outcome. Um, so I think it's challenging. I will say that I don't think these drugs are ready for prime time or ready for the guidelines. We already have a um, advanced life support algorithm that includes multiple drugs, rhythm checks, reversible causes, airway management, defibrillation. And I think if we want to add complexity to that, add two new drugs, there needs to be better evidence that they actually improve uh, more long-term survival and neurological outcome. I would like to have a final question with you because you created this very nice network in Denmark. Um, and I'm asking whether you, know, you have already thought about new studies in the field of in-hospital cardiac arrest, not only for restarting the art, but in general. What would be the one, two ideas you would keep pick up to maybe study in the next years? Yeah, so there are so many things you could do within hospital cardiac arrest. I think you could mimic many of the things that have been done in the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest setting, uh, both intra and post-arrest. So I think it would be reasonable to, to look at some of the drugs that are already administered, epinephrine, amiodarone, lidocaine. Personally, I think there's probably not clinical equipoise for some of those drugs. So that's not trials I will do, but I will support trials uh, elsewhere. Um, there's... Uh, Great debate about uh, airway management in the in-hospital cardiac arrest setting as well. We have seen some big trials in the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest setting and some large observational studies in the in-hospital cardiac arrest setting. So I think that was a good thing to tackle as well. And then I think we need to look at, at other things. Are there other things we could give neuroprotective drugs during cardiac arrest or other forms of vasoconstrictors? Of course, the post-cardiac arrest management of in-hospital cardiac arrest patients are also very important. I think this is an opportunity where some of the large trials that are ongoing perhaps should consider whether we should include in-hospital post-cardiac arrest patients as well. Um, I think once they're in the ICU, there's a lot of similarities actually between these patients. And I, I would like to see some of the big trials uh, start to include in-hospital cardiac arrest patients. So that could look at cooling, it could look at blood pressure management, ventilatory settings and things like that. Of course you should do um, subgroup analysis to look at the different uh, groups afterwards. But I think, once we have these big networks of, of, of trials and of centers, I think it's important that we get all the patients that we are interested in. And my goal the last few years have been to get more people interested in in-hospital cardiac arrest as well. Thanks, Lars. Thanks for your participation, your thoughtful comments. And again, congratulations again for your Vamika trial. I invite everyone to read it published yesterday on JAMA and hope to see you soon on the EasyChamp chat. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.